Good morning. Uh, we're glad to have you join us uh, this morning, this Sunday, uh, at Emmanuel Baptist. And we're thankful for your participation with us. We're looking to just bring encouragement to you from the Word of God to bring challenge into your life and into mine. So I'm looking forward to what we have uh, to see this morning. We're going to be in the Gospel of John. I want us to look at uh, life ambitions, the ambitions of our life, the things that drive us. Um, one of the questions that's important is what, what are, what's that decision that has been maybe the biggest decision of your life that's impacted you the most? I can think of a lot of decisions in my life. I know I talk to the church a lot, and one of those decisions I made was, what, 1980? I was a junior in high school. And uh, just through a friend of mine, I was invited to a Christian camp to work for the summer. And being exposed to that ministry, being involved with that ministry, changed my whole life. The trajectory of my life, I met my wife, I wound up in ministry, I followed after the Lord. Uh, so many things were, were significantly important to that decision. But there are other decisions in our lives that are important. I want you to just think about that for yourself. We are in the Gospel of John, and that question kind of comes to the forefront in this passage a little bit. We're in John chapter 14, so we're going to be looking at that uh, this week. Uh, we're using the English Standard Version, so um, uh, get your Bible, follow along, join us. We are looking at, um, at ambition. It kind of comes out, it's a word that just kind of comes to my mind as I think through this passage. The focus is, uh, the context is, is the beginning of this chapter, John chapter 14. The first seven verses just remind us of where we were two weeks ago before, before we joined together at Easter. Jesus says to his disciples, he says, do not be troubled. They are troubled because of the circumstances of knowing that something significant is about to happen in the life of Christ, that he may lose his life. He's a wanted man. He reminds them to believe in God, but to believe in him as well. He says, I'm going to my Father to prepare a place for you. He says, you know the place. And, of course, Thomas responds and says, no, we don't know. That gives him the opportunity to follow up and to provide that answer. He says, I am the way, I am the truth, and I am the life. He says, now you know the Father. And Philip says, no, we don't. Can you <laughs> follow up on this, affirm this, prove this? So that kind of takes us to, uh, to the beginning of this text, and I want to read from John 14 and the verses we're going to be in today. So I'm going to pick it up in verse 7, and we'll read through verse 14. And so the Lord says uh, to Philip and the disciples, If you had known me, you would have known my Father also. From now on, you do know him and have seen him. And Philip said to him, Lord, show us the Father, and it is enough for us. And Jesus said to him, Have I been with you so long, and you still do not know me, Philip? Whoever has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, Show us the Father? Do you not believe that I am in the Father, and the Father is in me? The words that I say to you, I do not speak on my own authority. But the Father who dwells in me does his works. Believe me that I am in the Father, and the Father is in me, or else believe on account of the works themselves. Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever believes in me will also do the works that I do, and greater works than these will he do, because I am going to the Father. Whatever you ask in my name, this I will do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you ask me anything in my name, I will do it. Pretty, pretty strong stuff here. Uh, some really deep stuff that he brings up. Uh, let's just pray and ask God to bless our time. Lord, this is your word. This is our time together. Uh, give us insight by the Spirit of God. Move our heart by the Spirit of God. Touch our lives by the truth of your word, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So we are in John uh, chapter 14. He speaks, he speaks really to the core of what is the most important to them in their life. He knows he's about to leave to go back to be with his father. So he needs to, he needs to speak to, to what is the greatest ambition, what's the greatest motivation in their life. What is it that they need to understand to move forward from the changes that are coming? Well, a number of ambitions come up here as we just look at that. The first one is simply this. They simply just want to know that God is there. They want to know God. Uh, is God still going to be with them? If Jesus leaves, is God still going to be there? 
You know, our, our greatest longing, man's greatest longing, is to have uh, a sense of significance, of a connection with, with God, uh, of that awareness. And so Philip says in verse 8, he, just, he says, Lord, show us the Father, and it's enough for us. He says to Jesus, I just want to see God. I want to see, I want to see the Father. Uh, I want to see the presence of God. That's an amazing question that he asks. Really, he's not any different uh, than, than what he has already seen and heard in the Scriptures. He is a student of, of the Scriptures. He remembers Exodus 33, where Moses did the same thing when he was with, before God. He said to, to him, If your presence will not go with me, do not bring us up from here. And Moses said to God, Please show me your glory. God responded and said, You cannot see my face, for man shall not see me and live. It is said of Moses that he met with God face to face. That's a word picture. That's a euphemism for, for the closeness of relationship and intimacy. He didn't actually see God's face. The scriptures are clear that we cannot see God in his, in his fullness. Um, but there's a yearning in our hearts to know that God is near. There's a yearning. We have questions in our lives and through our lives about, about who are we and and uh, what's our purpose? And we, we just have the sense that things are bigger than ourselves. There's a yearning in our hearts. Ecclesiastes 3.11 says this, God has put eternity into man's heart. And yet, so that he cannot find out what God has done from beginning to end. And to every human being, he has put an awareness that there is something vastly bigger than we are. But he hasn't answered all of our questions. Um, and so we're, we're in this search together as human beings about finding the purpose in life and, and, and the meaning in life of, of uh, pursuing ambitions in our life that make a difference. His, when he gave the Ten Commandments to his people in Israel, the very first commandment was this, you shall have no other gods before me. He knew that wherever they landed, they would have a, they would have a desire to worship someone or something because he's put that in our hearts. He has put within every, every individual's heart a desire to worship something bigger than themselves, to find a cause and understanding bigger than ourselves. That still is true in our culture today. He reminds us in Psalm 95 that true worship is this. We worship and bow down and we kneel before the Lord, our maker. This is his desire that ultimately every man, every woman, every child would, would come to that realization that he is our creator. He is our maker. And in response, we bow before him. He's, Jesus, as he's teaching, he touches that great motivation of who am I? What is most significant? What is most important? If I'm going to move forward in my life, I want to know that God is there. That's what Philip is really saying and asking. He says also, he touches on this desire that this simply is ours. We just want to do great things. We want to, we want to, we want to be uh, successful. We want to accomplish things in our life. Jesus touches base on that here. He says in verse 12, he reminds us that uh, whoever believes in him, we will do the works that he did and we'll do greater things than he ever did. That's, you know, the commentary has just come alive. There's so many responses to, to this section here. What does this mean? And what is Jesus talking about? And, and are we really going to do greater works than Jesus did himself? Um, we don't have time to answer all the questions, but let me, let me speak to that for just a second. Luke chapter 10 reminds us Jesus would send out the 12 to minister. He also had a group of 72 that he would send out. In Luke 10, we find this group of 72 that are serving the Lord. And the 72 have been sent out and they return and they're filled with joy. And they say, Lord, even the demons are subject to us in your name. And Jesus says, Behold, I have, I have given you authority to tread on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy, and nothing shall hurt you. Nevertheless, do not rejoice in this, that the spirits are subject to you. Now, if we came back from an experience like that, that's what we'd talk about. We'd be talking about the powerful things we were able to do. Um, the miraculous power that was, that was available to us. Uh, we talk about our churches and how big they are and how many programs we have and, 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 and how many things that are significant like that that just are touching people. And yet Jesus says there's something even more significant than that, than being able to do these miracles and have this kind of power in my name. It's this. We are to rejoice that, that your names, that the names of people are written in heaven, written in glory. The people, the people know Christ. 
a Savior. Come to faith in Him. God did, did give the apostles, the disciples, the ability to do wonderful miracles after He left. Acts chapter 2. Um, many wonders and signs were being done, and uh, the, awe, the awe of God was coming upon them because of the work that they were doing. And Paul reminds us here in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, is he speaking to the church? He says, you know what? There's apostles and there's prophets, there's teachers, there's miracles being done, there's healing, there's tongues, interpretation, all these things. But he said there's something even more significant than that, more um, satisfying even than these things which are given from God to us. And it's simply this. He says, I'm going to show you oh, even a more excellent way. I'm going to show you something that is even more powerful, more impactful in life, and even the ability to do these things, which are in the Scriptures. In chapter 13, he reminds us, if I can do all of these things, 1 Corinthians 13, if I can speak in tongues and I, I can tell the future or prophesy and I can understand all mysteries and my faith is, is amazingly able to understand and, and, and be powerful, uh, and I'm able to give away all that I have, and, and even, even I'm self-sacrificial in giving up my body. He says, you know what? Even greater than that, more powerful than those things, is the one who's able to love others biblically, who's able to show the love of Christ through their life. Because in all these other things, if I do those things and have the ability to do those things, but I don't have the grace and love of Christ flowing through my life, then when I encounter people with those abilities... If I lack the love of Christ in my life, then I will lack the ability to truly change their life. They won't see Christ. They'll see me and maybe ultimately be turned away because of because who they will see is me. He says what we need to show is love. Paul reminds us in Romans 15 that the purpose of all this is the gospel. His goal was to, was to share the gospel with the world, with the Gentiles. He had the opportunity here to do signs and wonders uh, the Spirit of God was powerful in Paul's life, but ultimately it was the ministry of the gospel that mattered. Right here, it was the ministry of the gospel, the gospel of Christ. Jesus Christ says, we're going to have the opportunity to do greater things, and we're going to speak to that in a second. But that's a motivation. You know what? We just want to be, we want to have uh, importance attached to the things that are the drives of our life. He speaks to that here. The other is simply this, the power of God. We want to experience power in our life as we're, as we're, uh, making a difference, we want, we want to have a sense that God is actually working through our life. He says in verse 13 and 14, he, speak, he touches on the power of prayer. He says, if we ask anything in the name of Christ, he'll do it. If we ask anything in his name, he'll do it. That's his promise. That's an ambition to have that kind of connection with God, that I can talk with God and, and he responds. These three, these three ambitions really speak to, to things that are significant and relevant in our life. We just want to know uh, the meaning of life and, and know what is the answer to, to that vastness, that, that, that the understanding that life is so much larger and bigger than me. It's found in God. Um, we want to do great things. We want, to have, we want to have power. We want to have impact. We want to make a difference. And so Jesus is going to speak to these. How do we give, how do we give meaning to the ambitions in our life? That's what I want us to see this morning. Because we are all people of ambition. Ambition drives us. Maybe your ambition right now during the pandemic is just to get out of bed. <laughs> maybe, it's to, maybe it's to excel at the schoolwork that you still need to do. And so you try to do your best. Maybe it's, it's to keep the home in order and, and, uh, and, have a, and have a tone that's really positive and great. And, and you're growing together and, and developing strength as a family together. Maybe you're... Maybe you're um, uh, moving forward and driving at just improving yourself, learning maybe a new skill online or, or, or tackling projects or home, at home or looking ahead at what life's going to be when this is over and, and where we're going to go. And so there's, there's a, we're, looking, we're looking with a perspective into our life and uh, life around us. How do we give meaning to those ambitions, to those causes, to those passions that are in our life? We really have two ambitions in life. That's what it comes down to. One is an ambition for the here and now. And one is an ambition for, the, for, uh, for eternity. Uh, James speaks to this. James chapter 4, James says these words. He says, Come now, you who say today or tomorrow we will go into such and such a town and spend a year there and trade and make a profit, yet you do not know what tomorrow will bring. What is your life? For you are a mist that appears for a little time and then vanishes. 
The great ambition here is this. It's, it's, it's operating in the here and now. Whatever this gentleman or this, per, this person is doing, it is, to, it is to make a difference in the here and now. It's to create a response and a, and a, and a result in the here and now. It's, it's, it's to be beneficial to, to me in the here and now. Yet God reminds us here that, that uh, there, is a, there is a perspective on life that we need that changes our drive to live just in the here and now. He finishes this verse and he says this. Instead, this is what we ought to say. If the Lord wills, we will live and do this and do that. The motivation, the drive that ought to be uh, pushing us and moving us forward is, is what is it that God wants us to do? And so to give, our, to give our ambitions, our passions, the greatest meaning, there's a few steps that are significantly important that come out of this passage. Let's look at those this morning. If I want to give purpose to my life and purpose to my ambitions, purpose to, to the things that I'm doing, the first step that I need to take that is important is I need to know Christ. In verse 7 and verse 9, it comes, comes into play here in this passage. We need to enter into a relationship with, with God but that is, that is a relationship that begins by knowing Christ. He says in verse, verse 7 here, Jesus says, If you had known me, he's talking to Philip and he's talking to the disciples, If you had known me, you would have known my father also. From now on, you do know him and have seen him. You know, Philip and the disciples have been with Jesus now for three years. If we even take, let's say a minimum of, if, if they've been with Jesus four hours a day, that's a small minimum. And there were short occasions where they were sent out and doing something else, or Jesus was to spend an evening alone. But for the most part, for three years, they were with Jesus every day, 365 days a year. And you, you, just, you just expand those hours out. If, if, we, under, if we understand it, then most people who go to church go, go to church an hour a, a week. They go on a Sunday at one hour, and they come home. You know, you have, you have here within the course of three years, you easily have 20, 30, 40 years worth of interaction with Christ. And he just simply asks this question. He just challenges them with this. He says, Philip, the greatest thing that you need to, need to desire is to know me. That has to be your starting point. Philip, Philip, do you know me? Disciples, do you know me? Judas has just walked out from the upper room and betrayed him. Judas walked with Jesus for three years, but his answer to this question was no. He didn't know Christ. He didn't have a relationship with Christ. He was filled with experience around Christ. He was involved in the cause of Christ, but he didn't know Christ. Jesus says here, if you had known me, but then he encourages them. He says, you do know me. Earlier he had said, you were all clean when you washed their feet. Just your feet's dirty. You're clean. He was telling them, you have a relationship with me. It's real and genuine. Verse 9, Jesus says this. Have I been with you so long you still don't know me, Philip? Whoever has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? You know, he, Jesus reminds them of what he has taught them all along. That, that he and the Father, Jesus and the Father, we are one. If you have seen me, you've seen the Father. Chapter 1, verse 18 of John. No one has ever seen God. The only God who is at the Father's side, he has made him known. There's two entities in that verse. No one's ever seen God, the Father. But the only God, that's Christ, who is at the Father's side, two persons in the Trinity, he, Jesus Christ, has made him known. John says in chapter 17, verse 3, and this is eternal life that they know him that they know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. He has reminded the disciples, and he has all the way through his ministry, that he and the Father are one. In fact, he says in John chapter 10, verse 14, I am the good shepherd. He says, I know my sheep, I know my own, and they know me. I know you, I know you eleven, I know all who are mine, and they know me. That's an encouragement. Paul would say this, this is our greatest passion, this is our greatest need, is to know Christ. He says, I want to know Christ. I want to know his power. I want to know the power that was a part of the resurrection. I want to share in, in, in uh, following the cost, paying the cost of what it means to follow after Christ. I want to become like him in his death. He says, you know what, the greatest drive, the greatest ambition in life is to know Christ. 
If, if we're going to fulfill the ambitions that really matter in our life, that God places into our life, that drive us, if we're going to make a difference in people's lives, the first step is to know is to know Christ. We are reminded in 1 Timothy 2.5 and 1 John 2.1 that Jesus Christ, he is the one that brings us into the presence of God. He is our advocate. He is our mediator. He is the one who, who saves us, who brings us before the Father and declares to the Father, this is my, this is my son, this is my daughter. They are clean because they know me. They have my name on their life. They're, the mark of my work on the cross is on their life. They know me. The second step to, to bringing meaning to, to ambition is this. It's, to, it's not just to know Christ, it's to believe him. To place our confidence in him. To look at him and say, that, and understand that he is able. That, that he always knows best. That he is the one that is working in our life. That he is the one that we need to place our eyes upon to step forward in faith and in trust and to begin to act upon the knowledge that comes from the beginning of that relationship. John 14, verse 10 through 11, he says, Do you not believe that I am in the Father and the Father is in me? The words that I say to you, I do not speak in my own authority, but the Father who dwells in me does his works. Believe me that I am in the Father, and the Father is in me, or else believe on the account of the works themselves. He's calling into faith. Not saving faith, or already saved. He's calling them to act on that faith. You believe that I'm the Son of God? They've already declared that. They've been clear on that. Now he's challenging them. Act on that. Step out in faith. Because you believe that's true, now walk forward into the unknown, and into the hours that are coming, into the days that are coming, and understand that I'm with you. Believe that that's true. Believe that when you have seen me, Philip, you have seen the very power of God. You have seen the Father. The Father is here, Philip. The Father is here to all of us, he says. The Father is right here because I am here. Last week, when we celebrated Easter, just a reminder, Jesus says, I am the resurrection and the life. And he calls us to faith. He calls us to believe. That's the first important step. As we enter into that relationship with Christ, we place our eyes upon him. We say, Lord, I believe you. I trust you because I do. The choices that are going to be coming out of my life, the decisions I'm going to be making from within my heart are going to reflect my total faith in you, my total trust in you. The ambitions, the passions that, that mark my life and that drive my life, the things that are most important in my life are going to be defined by this right here, that I trust you, I believe you, I know you. And so that leads us to our to our next step here. Verse verse 12, we see in this in this verse, it's a reminder to us that um, our ambitions find their greatest meaning when we do what is important to the Lord. We pursue his work for our life. Truly, truly I say to you, whoever believes in me will also do the works that I do, and greater works than these will he also do. When we trust Christ, our ambition changes. Uh, everyone is filled with ambition of some kind. Some are more ambitious, ambitious than others. Some have more drive than others. Those who accomplish so much in life, inventions and, and discoveries and excelling at music or athletics or uh, politics or whatever it might be, there is an ambition, there is a drive behind that. Whatever we do that causes us, that pushes us to excel is an ambition in our life. Jesus says what, what is most important is that if our ambitions are going are gonna to be ultimately satisfying in our life and filled with meaning that, that is eternal, that it is being shaped by this, that that ambition is being driven by how can I serve the Lord with that passion in my life? How can I use the passion that God has given me, use it for the Lord? How can I do the work that I'm doing and do it for the Lord? Jesus says here, we're going to do the works that he does, which means whatever he did, it's important to us. The way in which he served, it's important to us. The heartbeat that, that pulsated from his life, it's important to us. And he says, we're going to do even greater things than these. He says in John 17, verse 4, Jesus, I, I accomplished the work that you gave me to do. That was his greatest motivation. That was his greatest drive is simply to do the father's will. Jesus says, look at my life. Jesus says to the disciples, 
as you're as you're contemplating what the your, what the next steps are in the days to come and in the months to come, I want you to I want you to look at this. I want you to consider this. This is most important. The drive of your life, whatever the, whatever the ambition of your life is going to be, that ambition needs to be fueled by this one thing, this one thing that that you are doing the will of God in your life, that you are accomplishing and pursuing the will of God in your life. That is important. You know, we're at home and we're maybe doing projects or remodeling or fixing up or doing all these kind of things. You know, God is God is doing those kind of things in our life all the time. Maybe as we're at home and, and just doing simple things, in, in those mundane projects, look for the work of God in those things. As you're remodeling, be reminded that God is doing that in your life. He's doing a work in your life, and he's calling us to a work that involves constant change. He says in 1 John 2, 3 and 5, By this we know that we have come to know him if we keep his commandments. Whoever keeps his words, in him true the love of God is perfected. By this we may know that we are in him. The work of the believer is to follow in obedience to the word of God. The word of God. That is key. That is essential. Paul reminds us as he speaks to the church in, in Corinth, there was all kind of problems in that church. Um, drunkenness and all kind of things reflected in this verse. He says the reason that that's true, the reason that there is the patterns of sin there in the life of that church is because they have no knowledge, no knowledge of God. There are those who simply don't know the Lord. Uh, who are maybe in church or doing, doing, going through the motions of church, but don't have the relationship, don't know God, don't know the Lord. Um, our work, our work is not to hear now, our work is eternal, it's tomorrow. We are told to go make disciples. As we're going, that's, a, that's an active participle, that first word go in the Greek. It, is, it assumes that every, every child of God is actively already involved in going to be a witness for Jesus Christ. And as we're going, we're to make disciples. Uh, we're to teach them to honor the Lord. You know, the greater work of Christ isn't, isn't that we're more powerful than Christ. We cannot be more powerful than Christ. He said we're going to do greater work than he did. Does that mean we're more powerful than him? The answer is no. He is our power. He was our life. Uh, does that mean that we have, if we're going to do greater works than, that, than Christ, does that mean we need to have more faith, greater faith? I mean, if I'm going to do not only the works of Christ, but greater works than Christ, is he, is he giving me the impossible requirement that I have to have more faith in him? Of course not. He had perfect faith. I cannot have more faith than Jesus Christ did. Sometimes it is said, well, we don't have miracle working today. We don't have this because we lack faith. We believe the scriptures brought an end to those sign gifts because they were for the purpose of affirming the work of God. The work of the apostles, and when the scriptures were completed, the need for those signed gifts are no longer necessary. Now in Revelation, we're going to see them again. Because the church is going to be removed from this world. But in this time and place, we believe that those signed gifts aren't active anymore. Because the word of God is the power, it is the source, it is, it is, the, it is the means through which lives are, are transitioned and transformed and changed. Our work that is greater than Christ is, is the work of taking his gospel to the ends of the earth. And that's what we see here. Acts 1.8, he says to the disciples, to the apostles, your ministry is going to begin here in Jerusalem, but it's going to go to, it's going to, go to Judea and Samaria, and then it's going to go to the ends of the earth. That's where it's going to go. And, and we are still fulfilling that. You know, our Jerusalem is our home, it's our city, our Judea and Samaria, it's, it's our county, it's our, it's our state, it's our nation. The ends of the earth is the world, and we are taking the gospel with power, and his work is being done throughout the world. There is a greater work of Christ that is continuing through us because the gospel is going throughout the whole world. I think the greater works that he calls us to is, is the work of taking the gospel to a, to a lost world. It is the power of the Spirit of God in our life that transforms us and changes us. We're going to see that. Another element that transforms our ambition and, and creates and brings meaning to it is this. It's, it's to, to talk to the Lord in prayer. Uh, it's, it's to, with expectation, yield to Him uh, for power in our life. He says, he says here in, in verse 13 and 14, whatever we ask in His name, he says, I will do that. If you ask me anything in my name, I will do that. You know, all these pieces are significantly important in, in this 
proclamation from Christ, we have to know him. We have to have a relationship with Christ. We have to believe that he is. Because we believe, we walk with the Lord. That is so important. Um, we have, to, we have to, to, to honor him, honor his word, uh, to live for him, to talk with him. He says he answers prayer in our life because, because there, is a, there is a passion in our, des, in our desire to be used of God. He says when we pray in his name, this is what we're doing. When we pray in the name of Jesus Christ, in Jesus' name, it's not meant just to be a formula at the end of the meal or at the end of a prayer. It's meant to remind us that as we're praying, we're saying, Lord, uh, answer this prayer because, because this prayer, our prayer, the prayer from my heart, the prayer from our heart, is a desire to reflect your heart. It is a passion to do the work that you've called me to do. Uh, it is all about you. God, answer this prayer. Lord, answer this prayer because the intent of this prayer is to be more like you. It's to make a difference for the name of Christ. If that's our passion and our goal, then that meets, I believe, the, the, the proclamation that he's laying before us here. We're asking him to answer prayer in harmony with his nature. We're not asking him. When we come to him and we just ask for ourselves, uh, maybe selfishly, when we ask just so we can get what we want in the here and now, when we, when we ask without faith or doubting, when we ask for, for motivations that are, that are not from his heart, he's not going to answer those prayers. But when we come to him with a yielded heart, because prayer is yielding. Prayer is saying, God, I need you. Prayer is saying, Lord, I depend upon you. Do in my life what I can't do myself. Prayer, re God, release the, your power in my life through prayer. Change me. That's what prayer is all about. 1 John 3 reminds us, whatever we ask, we receive from him because we keep his commandments and we do what pleases him. He answers prayer in our life. When we pray in his name, we're praying on the basis of that relationship we have in Christ. When we are following in obedience to his word, he answers prayer. And he reminds us in 1 John 5.14, this is the confidence that we have toward him, that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. When the passion of our prayer is to say, Lord, uh, show me your will in my life today. Show me what you would have me to do, and I am willing to do that. Show me your purpose behind the things that are important in my life. Show me your purpose in this relationship. Show me your purpose in the choices that I have before me. Show me what you want me to do. God, that's what I want to do. It reminds us of Luke 11, verse 9, to be persistent, to ask and to seek and to knock. Ephesians 3.20, he reminds us that... that uh, he is power beyond imagination. He is power beyond comprehension. He blesses and he works and he accomplishes in our life miraculously. What he does only he can do. And he opens doors and he breaks down barriers and he transforms the barriers in our heart. And he makes us more like him and he conforms us to him and that's what he does. The last element here of just... Of just uh, uh, having an ambition that is meaningful and matters to the Lord is found in this in this last last element. It's in verse 13. Well, we're to do everything for the Lord. Do everything to please Him. He says in verse 13 that the Father may be glorified in the Son. Jesus, as He was talking to the disciples, He's going to say this, I have glorified you on earth. How? Because I finished the work He gave me to do. But this was my purpose. This was my goal. It was to honor my Father. It was to honor the Lord. It was, to, it was to honor Him in everything that I did. Everything that I did was to honor my Father. And that is it. One of the great verses in Scripture comes out of 1 Corinthians 10, 13, 10, 31. Whether we eat or drink or whatever we do, we're to do it for the glory of God. We're to do it uh, in awareness of the presence of God. We're to do it so that He is pleased. We're to do it so that the impact of what I am doing draws people to Christ. Whatever the ambition of your life is, whatever the drive of your life is, Jesus reminds his disciples and he reminds us that that drive is only going to be accomplished to be most fulfilling back into your life when that drive reflects values that are eternal and not just in the here and now. He says the most important thing is having a relationship with Christ. The most important thing is by faith moving forward and doing the work of Christ. It's talking to him in prayer and as we're praying, 
Letting God shape our hearts so that the motivation of our hearts is this, to live and to shine for the glory of God. 2 Corinthians 4, 6. For God who said, let light shine out of darkness has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. When we know God, we know God because we know Christ. To know Christ is to know the Father. To have entered, entered into a relationship with God is to have entered into a relationship with Jesus Christ. To say, Lord, I need a Savior. Lord, I want, I want a relationship with the Father, and so I lay my life before you. Lord, have my life. Forgive me, cleanse me, wash me, change me, conform me, use me. And then everything else that we do in life is driven by that ambition. He's shaping the ambitions of the disciples here. In these three elements that he brought up, to know God and, and to do his works and, and to be powerful in prayer ultimately is driven by this one ambition that comes out of a relationship to Christ. He's reminding them, but as you move forward, this is what's going to, this drive is going to make the difference. It's going to keep you stable. It's going to bring joy in your life. It's going to motivate everything that you do. It's going to fill your life with hope and certainty. You can count on it. He's going to continue. He's going to share with us more, show us more. But he says here as we close, the greatest, the greatest motivation in our life is to live for Jesus Christ, to do everything that we do for the glory of God. If that is my ambition, that is the greatest ambition I could possibly have. I want to challenge you to look at your life through the lens that Jesus Christ has laid before us. Lord, give me that ambition. Lord, may I serve you with this ambition, with this goal, with this strength of purpose in my life. God, bring me to that place. Lord, we pray this morning that you would just, by your spirit, bring that motivation with clarity and with focus into our, into our heart and our life. Through a relationship with Christ, we find the ability and the enablement by your grace to accomplish these very things. Lord, this is our life's work. Lord, we are constantly being shaped by these forces of having yielded to your purpose and plan and saying, Lord, I want to be like you. He is shaping these disciples and he is shaping us. He is building us today so that we would accomplish these very things right here. Our Father and our Savior, Jesus Christ, they delight at pouring into our life the resources, the love, and the grace, the enablement, the ability to accomplish these very things. He delights in giving us the perspective that sees eternal values, that understands that people are the most important thing, that people need the Lord. The disciples are going to be driven by this ministry and this mission. Lord, drive us by that same mission, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. We just encourage you to consider this, to prayerfully look at what the Spirit of God would have you to do in your response to the Lord here. And we invite you to come back and to join us. We, uh, you can always follow up. You can talk with us. You can connect with us. We invite you to do that. Thank you for joining with us today. May the Lord bless you and keep you in Jesus' name.